Okay, the next one we're going to be covering in our overview is uh, number 23 on our list of 27 pioneers, S. N. Haskell. We covered him in the Lest We Forget, Volume 7, Number 2, and we highlighted there his work with the literature work. The article is actually entitled on him, Stephen N. Haskell, A Pioneer in Missionary Promotion at Home and Abroad. And uh, that's on pages three to six of this issue. We have a picture of him here. This gentleman here is a little bit of a younger picture. We have, I have some older ones too, where he's all gray or all white. <laughs> but uh, the resolution of those other ones were not quite as good, so I put this older, uh, younger one there of him. Stephen Haskell was born um, April 22, 1833, in Oakham, Massachusetts, of parents who were members of the Congregational Church. At the age of eight, showing a little bit about his uh, character, he signed a temperance pledge as a, as a boy. At the age of 15, 1848, he was converted and joined his parents' church. So mid-teens there. During his teen years, he also learned the soap-making trade and was hired by an old farmer named Hal to help manage his farm. Duke. Thanks for that. So the, uh, this old farmer named Hal was near the end of his life because two years later, when he's 17 years old, 1850, he marries Mary Hal, the daughter of Farmer Hal, a lady who is 20 years older than he, who was in poor health, and he had, he had promised Farmer Hal Farmer Hal had asked him, pled with him, to promise that he would take care of his daughter after he died. Well, he died in 1850. And so how's a 17-year-old boy going to take care of a, a lady? He married her, okay? She's 20 years older than he is. She's 37 years old. Um, that shows you a little bit about him, too, right? Uh, not, not many 17-year-old uh, young men would do that, I would, I would dare say. 1852, at the age of 19, he, hear, he heard his first Advent sermon, and he was so enthusiastic about the subject that he was challenged to preach, <laughs> which he began to do along with his soap selling. Okay, this is an Advent sermon. He's preaching the Advent message. This is not the third angel's message. The Advent message, okay? 1853, he's age of 20. He learns of the Sabbath from a William Saxby in Springfield, Massachusetts, shortly before he takes a trip north into Canada to preach to the Adventists. So again, these, Advent young, these young men who had a burden to preach, they would go around where there were Adventists and preach to them. Travel. You know, he's traveling from New England clear up into Canada now. And one of the reports is that Saxby apparently gave him a track called Elihu on the Sabbath, and he took that track with him on this trip, apparently. And one of the, one of the um, historians said that it was in a Canadian forest <laughs> that he made his decision you know, to keep the Sabbath. Um, his wife apparently wrote to the Review uh, telling s some of these stories. Um, her recollections are not always in agreement with what I've read elsewhere, so which is interesting that, that, that they're a little bit different, but they're not... They're pretty much in, in, in accord. This track I found listed in the reviews, and the first one was uh, August 11, I think it was, 1853 here, um, page 56 of that issue. And this is, how, this is actually taken right out of the review, how it's worded, Elihu. This is the signature of an old tract entitled Solemn Review of the Sabbath, which we published in the review of June 23. So that, that's June 23 of 1853, right? They published in the review. Several brethren called for it in tract form, but none of their calls came till after the type was distributed. We think of getting out a large edition of the tract soon. If 5,000 copies should be called for, we could furnish it for $100 per, $1 per hundred. Those who wish quantities of the tract will please send their orders. We will furnish it at cost. Okay? That was August. November of the year, 
they are listing the Sabbath by Elihu, 16 pages, price one cent, postage one cent. That was November 8, 1853, uh, page 144. So there's evidence in the review of this little tract that, that helped uh, Haskell. Elihu was, was the, one of the men who came to speak with Job. And I believe that they just used this as a, um, a way of explaining the Sabbath, not that he actually talked about the Sabbath. Uh, it was, of, of, you know, there was the, these three, three people that came to talk to Job, and this was the fourth one, and his counsel was, was much better than the other ones. And so I think it was a, a sort of way that they, somewhere I read who actually wrote it, and it was somebody else's name, I didn't record that here. But um, there, someone who put it together felt that it was a useful way of, of just talking about that. Yes, that's true. I've not read through the 16 pages. It is something that we should, I should probably read at some point, and then I can maybe understand better why they, they use the name Elihu. Next year, 1854, at the age of 21, he attended an Advent conference in Worcester, Massachusetts, to share the Sabbath. Okay. So he's going to this meeting of Adventist, First Day Adventist, and he's going to share the Sabbath with him, right? It wasn't, it wasn't like this was the first time an Adventist started keeping the Sabbath, because that started back in the 1840s, right? James and Ellen accepted it in 46. Bates has been promoting it for years. So he went there very enthusiastic. He's a 21-year-old man, you can imagine, his zeal. And he thinks he's going to convince everybody, and his friends didn't want to hear anything. But there was a Thomas Hale of Huberston, and he and his family accepted the Sabbath. So there was fruit. Bates came and visited with the Haskells. He got wind of them. If he got wind of anybody that was interested in the Sabbath, he went and visited them. <laughs> he tracked them down. He was traveling all over. He visited with the Haskells, and he shared all the teachings of the third angel's message, which the Haskells accepted. And they ordered every track the review office printed. Okay, and here is a record of some of this. Okay, February 6, 1855, in the Review and Herald, page 175, only a few months, this is actually, I believe, a Mrs. Haskell writing, only a few months since we were living wholly regardless of the Sabbath of the Lord our God, and without ever having had our attention called to his claim. But blessed be God, even the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has enlightened our minds, and we are now endeavoring to yield the most implicit obedience to the demands of his holy commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So they wrote into the review and told, you know, their experience. And then we find this little statement from Joseph Bates from the March 6, 1855 review, page 192. The, tra the paper and tracts which brother and sister Haskell sent for, remember they ordered all of them? See review number 22, have come to hand and they are reading with interest and ask why it is that we have never seen the light on these important subjects before. They are anxious to have all the tracts that teach our Bible position. And in another place, you have their names for the review and the youth instructor. My labors close here this evening. From this, I think of proceeding northward to Vermont and New Hampshire. Joseph Bates, Hubbardston, Massachusetts, February 12, 1855. So he's writing in his, his traveling reports, you know, where he is and what he's doing. And so it's useful to read the reviews from that viewpoint if you like, just to see what was happening. Ten years later, 1865, he's 31 years old, he moves uh, to South Lancaster, Massachusetts, from where, he, where he'd been living. Um, apparently no longer taking care of that farm. <laughs> and um, it's while he's there, some five years later, age of 36, he organizes the first tract in missionary society. Here's how A.W. Spaulding, uh, in his 1947 book, Footprints of the Pioneers, page 14, reported this. In South Lancaster, Elder Haskell not only supervised the conference, because as we're going to see, uh, that's where a conference finally is formed. First conference that was formed was where? Of, of churches that believe the Third Angel's message? Michigan. So they're, they're just organizing conferences in these years. This is 1869. Michigan Conference, I think it was 1861, was it? If I remember correctly. In South Lancaster, Elder Haskell not only supervised the conference, but gathered the sisters of the local church together and formed them into a prayer band 
whose burden was first their children. In the beginning, there were four members. Then as the church grew, there were ten, and presently, forty-five. In 1869, they organized themselves as the Vigilant Missionary Society. This is something new. <laughs> okay? So he went there in 64, and that paragraph sort of summarized what he did between 64 and 69. In 69, they became this Vigilant Missionary Society. In 1870, at the age of 37, he's, he's a good organizer. And they decide, you're going to be a president of this new conference. He's elected president of the newly organized New England Conference, which comprised New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. The next year, at the age of 38, November of 1871, James White visited the New England Conference and observed that under the well-directed efforts of Brother Haskell, our people are in advance of those in any other part of the field in systematic, energetic action for the advancement of the cause of truth. This man was an organizer. He knew how to get people to work. And so that was his strong point. 1874, age of 41, the General Conference formed the General Tract Society. They said, this needs to be bigger than New England. We need to do this everywhere. They formed the General Tract Society and invited Haskell to travel to all the conferences to promote and organize the local activities. 1876, at the age of 43, two years later, he... There's the largest camp meeting ever held at Groveland, Massachusetts. So they're using camp meetings as well. And apparently, I don't fully understand this, they felt that he could even help organize places he wasn't at because they made him the absentee president in 1879 at the age of 46 of the California Conference. He was the absentee president. <laughs> and he was that until 1887, which was a total of eight years. 1882... He's 49. He, he founded South Lancaster Academy. And here's the description of it in our Lest We Forget. Uh, actually, it's taken from the encyclopedia, SDA encyclopedia. April 19, 1882, the New England school, yet unnamed, opened its doors. Nineteen students started classes, and five more joined them a few days later. S.N. Haskell was the founder and builder of the school. So this man's a doer, right? Goodloe H. Bell was the first principal. In 1883, the school was named South Lancaster Academy. In 1885, the school expanded to include college preparatory. Teacher training was added in 1886 with development of a normal school. That's what they call teacher training. Um, J.T. Browning Missionary Industrial School was the title of that normal school. In 1918, the school name was changed to to Lancaster Junior College in 1922, Atlantic Union College began to operate on the senior college level. So there's a little overview. In 40 years' time, it goes from a, a school of 19 students to a senior college. 1882, same year, 49 years of age, he traveled to Europe for six months. God's providence opened the way for distribution of publications to passengers on ships to London and for shipment of tracts to other parts of the world. He visited France and Switzerland, seeing J.N. Andrews, who at that time was in poor health. No, he, he died shortly after that. Um, whose French publications were making work among the French a success. 1844, a couple years later, he's 51 years old. And in, on March the 11th, he wrote this report on the first two years of this South Lancaster, South Lancaster, Lancaster School. As we look back over the past two years, we can truthfully say that God has dealt with us in great mercy and has given us largely of His Holy Spirit. Quite a large number have been converted and baptized. There are also at least 12 active laborers in the cause today in different conferences, a number of whom came to school without any idea of engaging in the work of God. So here's young people that want to get some schooling, but they catch a vision while they're there. That's the influence of the school. Uh, Twelve active laborers who finished at this school in two years' time, and they're out working in conferences. For these things we thank God and take courage. That was in the Review and Herald, March 11, 1884, page 165. The next year, he's 52 years old. 1885, he leads the first group of missionaries to Australia and New Zealand. While he's there... He apparently boarded in a home of a family by the name of Hare, and they hear him praying. 
and they are converted. And that's the, that's the Hare family. That, that's well known. Robert, Robert B. Hare comes from that family. And Maggie Hare is Ellen White's secretary taking notes at the Armadale Conference when she's there later in the 1890s. That's the Hare family. 1887, age of 54, travels to Norway for the first European camp meeting and council, and he meets Hetty Hurd at a Bible instructor training school in London. And uh, remember that name. Uh, 1888, 55, he is the temporary chairman of the Minneapolis General Conference. And again, I don't find that any of these first-generation Adventists, other than Ellen White, really grasp the significance of Minneapolis. But I do see that, that uh, Haskell was, was probably more influenced by the gospel message than any of that first generation outside of Ellen White, from what I perceive at present. 1889, age of 56, he traveled to Europe, South Africa, India, China, Japan, and Australia. Does that sound like going around the world? That's what it was. This, this was the sur first circumnavigation of the, of the world by an Adventist. But he wasn't traveling alone. He went, there was a young man who had just come to Battle Creek off a farm in Kansas, born in Ireland, by the name of P.T. McGann. And the building right next to us has his name on it. That traveled with him as an assistant. And McGann got home before Haskell did. So he was the first Adventist that went all the way around the world. <laughs> McGann was the one that did that. Did he leave somebody to take care of his wife? It's clear that, that, that there must be people helping out. His wife, actually, she was in better health later in her life than she was when he first married her. So she, she was not to, a totally invalid uh, the whole of her life. Um, so, obviously, there was a lot of traveling done by these men, and their wives were, had a lot of time when they, when they spent alone. Um, but think of the wives of the uh, ship captains, like Joseph and Bates' wife. He was gone for months at, at, at sea, and they never knew if they'd see him again. But, so these wives of these traveling workers, uh, a little bit like the, the wives of sea captains. On this trip, Haskell baptized the first converts in China and Japan, according to the report. 1880, 1891, he was 58 years old. He was president of the California Conference a second time, now for a period of three years, three or four years there. And then in 1894, his first wife, Mary, when he's 61, she would be how old? 81. She dies. And she's buried in Napa, California. 1896, two years later, he's 63 and he goes to Australia again and helps to establish Avondale. That's when Ellen White is over there, okay, in the, in the 1890s. And then next year, 1897, he's 64 years old, and he writes to Hetty Hurd, and says, I want to marry you. And she, I, I don't know whether she's still in England, but she travels to Australia. They get married, and they honeymoon in a tent on the Avondale campus. He's 64 years old. Okay, picture, picture that. Uh, honeymooning in a tent. Uh, 1901, at the age of 68, he published The Story of Daniel the Prophet. Obviously, this man's not just been traveling and organizing. He's been studying his Bible and taking notes. And finally, at this ripe age of 68, he's publishing his, his, his book on Daniel. He starts with Daniel, whereas I believe Uri Smith started with Revelation, didn't he? But he's starting with Daniel. So, story of Daniel the prophet. 1903, at the age of 70, he organized effective city work in New York City. And listen to how Spalling describes this. He captained a diverse corps of workers in his country's metropolis. Speaking of New York City set forth a plan for the comprehensive and well-articulated city campaign. It contained the following, that house-to-house -house literature be give, work be conducted, opening doors for Bible studies by competent instructors, that health service and education be given through vegetarian restaurants, hydropathic treatment rooms, and lectures, that when the groundwork had been sufficiently done, there follow evangelistic meetings, that all these workers be united, and so far as feasible, resident, that means living there, in a central worker school in charge of the director, in charge of the director of the city work. That's in um, Spalding's Origin and History of the SDAs, page 114. So again, 
Right. I emailed him. I emailed uh, Dave Fiedler this statement because we just heard a program on city work. And Haskell was not mentioned, as I recall, but this would be very interesting to see how much uh, Haskell's work is also as a pioneering work in this area of city work. 1905, he's 72 years old, and now he publishes his second book on prophecy, The Story of the Seer of Patmos. By the way, I just recall that he wrote to Ellen White about this. He had, a, he, had, he had a burden to publish what he had been studying in the prophecies. But he said to her, you know, Uriah Smith has already published on this. Should I do this? And she wrote back and said, one man isn't given all the light. If the Lord tells you to write, write. You know, she encouraged him to do this. And so he, he, he was encouraged in doing this. By the way, I also believe that before he married Hetty Hurd, am I correct, Colleen? That the the story is that he actually proposed Ellen White. That's what I was told when I worked at Elm Haven by the family. Okay, the family and told they her. They have in her in her bedroom mm -hmm. two pictures of her sons and pastors as being there too. Okay, so apparently Ellen White was a widow, and when Hassel became a widower, he proposed to her uh, before he married Hetty, and uh, obviously she wanted, as was stated earlier, she wanted to be focused on her writing, which was, she was really working on hard. And actually, there was more correspondence between Haskell and Elm White than anybody else. Okay, more correspondence, yeah. more correspondence between her and, and, uh, so well. and uh, Ellen White than she anyone else. She said it would be confusing, too, if she changed her last name. Right. Changing the last name of Ellen White yeah, we, um, would be confusing at that point. But a lot of people don't are not aware of that. <clears throat> And again, these are the human interest parts of the pioneers that make them makes them real people for us as as we understand the issues they went through in life and losing partners and having problems and all the other stuff that we've looked at. Um, okay, so then 1908, 75 years of age, he's president of the Carolina, Carolina, California Conference a third time, and that's until 1911. 1914, he's 81 years old, and he publishes The Cross in its shadow. So this man is not, you know, sitting back, taking retirement, taking it easy. All this wealth of information and knowledge that he has from years of Bible study, he's publishing. And we can be blessed by that. These books are on the CD-ROM, by the way. And so they're, they're all available there if you want to look at them in computer form or want to search them for certain topics and things like that. Each book can be searched separately. So if you want to look like in the cross in the shadow, what does he say about the most holy place? You can search for most holy place in that. 1915, at the age of 82, he preached at Ellen White's funeral service. And then seven years later, at the age of 89, he himself dies. And I believe his instructions were, bury me near the nearest wife. The nearest wife. Wherever I die, bury me in the nearest wife. And so he was apparently near to Napa, which is where his first wife was, um, because I think he outlived. I believe that she had passed away as well. Uh, if, I read that somewhere, but I don't recall exactly where it was. Um, there, is, there is in him uh, a uh, lack of, uh, how can I say it? being locked into a particular view or position or choice. Regarding? Regarding anything. Well, okay. so you, 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 if, he did, if he didn't get the okay from Alan White, he uh, went on. And, and, uh -huh. and then, too, the idea that he... Uh, he seemed to have... That anywhere yeah. That's close. yeah, he seemed to have a flexibility, that's right. perhaps that's what you're trying to say, right. that's that's some right. of the others lacked, and it enabled him to be an organizer and thinking new ideas and probably, you know, pu pushing the envelope in ways that the others couldn't do things. And he had to be really into all cultures. Yeah, cross-culture. He didn't have that. Cross-culture, right. Traveling, be so right. Successful. Yeah, I don't recall exactly where I read about that thing of being, uh, burying me, burying me that... Uh, <coughs> As he said, you know, maybe I, I might be getting mixed up with Luffer on that one, because Luffer had three wives, and he did outlive all of his wives, you know. So uh, I might I might stand corrected on that fact that uh, Hetty did not outlive him. Anyway, this is the closing comment on him that I have, and this is from W. A. Spicer, who wrote in the review the year that he died. 
uh, December 14, 1922 Review, page 7. Elder Haskell was a pioneer in missionary promotion at home and abroad. He believed the third angel's message with all his heart and soul as Christ's last message to men. And the one business of Seventh-day Adventists, to his mind, was to give this message to the world. He found this truth on the road as a salesman. And until age crept upon him, he was ever on the road <laughs> carrying the treasure of truth to others. Good summary of his life. He was a peddler of the truth, we can say. Not doing the, the type of trafficking that Lucifer did in heaven, but the, the holy trafficking that uh, Christ did as he went from place to place, sharing the good news of the gospel. What does A-R-S-H stand for? Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. That's the, the book code for that periodical. Um, all these codes on the CD-ROM we call book codes, but some of them are not books, they're actually periodicals. And that's the code that we have for that. And you'll, you, you can search on those codes, by the way, and find what you, what you need to, have to on them. Well, that was sort of a... He never had children. Correct. Correct. Uh, they remained a child, as uh, Haskell's did. And um, again, let me, just, let me just say that as we go through these overviews, this, we went through his, his fairly quickly. Um, these are basically just a sample of what we have on their lives. You know, just what we can put in two pages. But um, I encourage you to read more about them and read the, you can start with the eight page periodical articles that we, issues that we have on them. Um, and that's a good place to begin. So let's thank God for Haskell, Brother Haskell and his life of service and his example and also the writings that he left us to read. And I believe uh, Colleen has a notebook on him as well that you can look at at the end. Did he start publishing the Bible training school? Yeah, Bible training school, I think it was. And, and he, he's also well known, I didn't mention it here, for the, the little uh, Bible handbook, which is a summary of Bible topics and, and teachings and where you can find text on them. So he was, he was a, not only an organizer, but he knew how to, to give people tools <laughs> to do be soul winners and give Bible studies and things like that too. So again, I encourage you to review his life and get better acquainted with his material.